You've heard of the Gestapo and the NKVD before, but what about the Kempatai, whose members were largely responsible for Imperial Japan's atrocities? The Kempatai was Japan's military police and secret police force during the Second World War, and there's no doubt about it, they were a bunch of sadistic a-holes. In this video, we're going to be talking about the structure of the Kempai Tai and some of the unforgivable things they got up to during the war. The Kempatai wasn't created during the Second World War. The organization was established back in 1881, stealing a bunch of ideas from France's national police force, the National Gendarmerie. At its conception, it consisted of just 349 men. The Kempatai was technically a part of the Imperial Japanese Army, though it also carried out tasks for the Imperial Japanese Navy, the Naomosho, or Home Ministry, and the Shihiyosho, or Ministry of Justice. Because the Japanese army and navy hated each other's guts, as we've discussed in a previous video, the navy had its own military police, the Toketai. This force was far smaller than the Kempatai and existed in part to stop the Japanese army from sticky beaking in naval affairs. Under the umbrella of the Kempatai, most Kempa found themselves working in administration, police, special duties, or in auxiliary units composed of local forces in Japanese occupied areas. Kempatai HQs and Field Kempatai, the latter composed of between 315 and 600 personnel, were attached to area armies. Field Kempatai could be broken down into Buntai, or sections, and Bunkentai, or detachments, the smallest Field Kempatai units. In 1901, the Toko, or Special Higher Force, was formed. Also known as the Thought Police, this was a civilian secret police force under the Home Ministry and can be thought of as the civilian counterpart to the Kempatai. The Toko policed internal affairs, suppressing anarchists, socialists, communists, pacifists, student activists, certain religious groups, and anyone who disrespected the emperor. Via a network of informants, the organization had made over 59,000 arrests by 1936 alone. While the Kempatai and Toko were separate organizations, the Kempatai had its own secret police branch. According to a report from the June 1945 issue of the US Military Intelligence Service's Intelligence Bulletin, practically all members of the Kempe were volunteers, both commissioned and enlisted personnel, and the standards for admission to the organization were high. The enlisted men had to hold the rank of Jotahai, or Superior Private, and had to meet high physical and mental requirements. They also had to be politically reliable. Enlistees went to military police schools or were trained in special units. NCOs and officers were held to a higher standard, needing six or more years of military experience to be considered. Depending on their role, Kempei generally wore Japanese army uniforms, cavalry uniforms, or civilian clothes with a badge underneath. In uniform, Kempe wore a white armband on their left arm which read Kempe. Officers carried a pistol and a sabre, while enlisted men got a pistol and a bayonet. Kempe had a range of responsibilities. They concerned themselves with intelligence, counterintelligence, espionage, propaganda and counterpropaganda, working under disguise at home and in foreign countries where they often employed local informants. At home, they protected military zones, maintained military discipline, dealt with crimes committed by Japanese army personnel, dealt with conscription laws, maintained security by spying on and arresting possible traitors, defeatists, and people harboring anti-war sentiments, and lastly, crushed threatening rumors and anyone trying to undermine Imperial Japan. Overseas, they seized supplies and food from local populations, managed rations, recruited locals for fun time auxiliary units, maintained rear area security, managed prostitutes, and forcibly recruited sex slaves. Notably, Kempe were also in charge of absolutely ruining the lives of prisoners of war. When it came to methods, Kempe loved a bit of torture, so much so that they had their own handbook on this depraved art form of theirs. 
While the Kempatai certainly inflicted great suffering before World War II, such as during Japan's annexation of Korea and the early stages of the Second Sino-Japanese War, we're going to focus on their Kempei atrocities in the Second World War. In World War II, at least 11 field Kempatai were active outside of Japan, in Japan's captured and occupied territories, which were mostly in the Pacific. By the end of the war, the United States Army estimated that the Kempatai had more than 35,000 discernible members, with that number estimate climbing to 75,000 to account for undercover personnel and such. After the Japanese 25th Army defeated the Allies in Singapore and seized control of the island in February 1942, the Kempatai set up a headquarters in a YMCA building which became known as Kempatai East District Branch. The building was used to administer the 200 regular Kempe and the 1000 auxiliary Kempe in Singapore. It was also a house of pain. Many civilians were tortured here, many of them innocent. On the 10th of October 1943 alone, the Kempatai arrested and tortured 57 civilians they suspected were involved in a raid on Singapore Harbour. Really, the attack was orchestrated by the joint British and Australian Spec Ops Z Special Force. One Singaporean woman, Elizabeth Choi, was held in YMCA for nearly 200 days. They actually let her go in the end, but she suffered no less. In Choi's words, when my interrogators could not get any information out of me, they dragged my husband out, tied him up and made him kneel beside me. Then, in his full view, they stripped me to the waist and applied electric currents to me. The Kempe also erected iron stakes outside the YMCA building and mounted them with severed heads. Sundakan POW camp on Borneo was hell on earth for the allied POWs, most the Aussie, held there by the Kempatai from July 1942 to May 1945. Putting aside the infamous Sundakan death marches for a moment, Aussie Lieutenant Rod Wells described his own experience with one of the Kempatai's interrogation methods. The interviewer produced a small piece of wood like a meat skewer, pushed that into my left ear and tapped it with a small hammer. I think I fainted sometime after it went through the drum. Sibyl Kathigasu was a nurse living in Japanese-occupied Malaya during the war. Sibyl and her husband provided medical supplies and services to the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. The Kempatai caught wind of them and arrested them in July 1943. They were tortured for two years. In Siebel's words, They heated iron bars in a charcoal brazier and applied them to my legs and back. They ran a stick between the second and third fingers on both of my hands, squeezing the fingers together and holding them firmly in the air while two men hung from the ends of the cane, making a seesaw of my hands and tearing the flesh between my fingers. Also in Malaya, an unnamed magistrate was arrested by the Kempatai because they suspected he was a spy. The Kempatai tortured him by burying him. As per the magistrate, they buried me in the ground, leaving just my head above ground. I was then made to close my eyes. One of the Kempatai men put his sword against my throat as if to cut it, and kept it there for some minutes. After that, I was unburied and left out in the sun for the rest of the day. After that, they shoved the magistrate in a 40-gallon drum of oily water and put the lid on. This didn't kill him though. The Japanese invaded the Dutch East Indian island of Java on the 24th of February 1942, and it was theirs by the 12th of March. This was a disastrous turn of events for Jan Ruff O'Hearn, an Australian woman living on the island with her mother and two sisters. All four women were taken to Ambarawa prison camp where they were held for a couple of years. In February 1944, the Kempatai took her from the camp and forced her into sexual slavery in a military brothel, where they kept her for three months before sending her back to Ambarawa. In Jan's words, they dragged us away one by one. I could hear screaming and this large, fat, bald Japanese officer appeared, grinning at me. I put up an enormous fight, but he just dragged me to the bedroom. I never thought suffering could be that terrible. We've covered the dreaded Japanese Biological and Chemical Warfare Unit 731 before, but it's worth mentioning that the Kempatai established this unit, which experimented on living beings in a variety of ways. To name just a few of these so-called experiments, 
They amputated people's limbs and otherwise operated on them while they were still alive, spun them in centrifuges until they died, exposed them to toxins like pufferfish venom, exposed them to lethal x-ray doses, infected them with horrible diseases, and raped them to spread sexually transmitted infections and force pregnancies for further testing. The Kempatai were responsible for rounding up many of these unfortunate souls. Those were literally just a handful of the atrocities perpetrated by Imperial Japanese military police and the secret police force the Kempatai during the Second World War. But what do you think? Did you know that it was the Kempatai, not just the Japanese army, that was responsible for many of Japan's atrocities? Had you heard about the Japanese thought police? Can you think of any other atrocities perpetrated by the Kempatai or anything else they got up to in the war? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always guys, thank you for watching and I hope you learned something new.